I think that the best murder mysteries also have the element of psychological thriller. I think they must genuinely scare you, so sometimes they have the element of a horror film. I think they have to be continually suspenseful. I think they have to present in the audience, however glamorous the location or the nature of the story, they have to drip feed a sense of dread, a sense that whatever enjoyment and interplay between the characters is being had, that there is no parlor game at, at play here. There is the very, very serious issue of murder and that prospect and the prospect that any one of you at any time any character could be subject to that terrible fate, I think needs to be constantly, unsettlingly, agitatedly there. Agatha Christie often puts her characters in these sort of gilded cages. In Death on the Nile, the Karnak, a Nile steamer, is a luxurious, confined, claustrophobic space where the wedding party that enters with a dozen glamorous people all coming to enjoy themselves suddenly find that it's a dangerous space where murder occurs, where people are hiding, where lies are being told. And so we were able to create the space and the splendor, the craftsmanship, the detail, whether it's in cutlery or glasses or lights or in the amount of openness to the river and the great sites of ancient Egypt that are out there. We were able, really able to construct something so beautiful, something that as soon as our film audience saw it, you would want to be part of. And in fact, when we shot this, we didn't even show it to our cast until we filmed them getting on the boat for the first time. Uh, so we wanted to have this feeling of, gosh, what an exciting place to be until that exciting place turns out to be what a dangerous place to be. And Agatha Christie, I think, does that constant back and forth between what appears to be safe and what appears to be dangerous. And, and Death on the Nile plays with that dynamic at all times. I have investigated many crimes, but this has altered the shape of my soul. I think just from the Agatha Christie universe, it would be great to see Hercule Poirot and Miss Marple get together. I think if they were able to travel in time, having them meet at a club in London with Sherlock Holmes would be pretty interesting because I think they both think that they're the cleverest man in the room. Um, so it would be interesting to see how they pretended that they weren't. I think they're both capable of being very sort of chameleon-like in the way they present themselves, depending on the situation. I think in the world of sort of superhero assembly, I think there are a couple of detective matchups that would be fun. That would be fun for starters, Sherlock, Hercule, and Jane Marple. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. I had been involved with the play Hamlet ever since I saw Richard Chamberlain, the great American actor on television, and then Derek Jacobi on stage in England when I was a very young man, and was always intrigued by this uh, extraordinary character who's at the center of a, re a revenge drama. And uh, all across my early acting career, I got a chance to play the role. So by the time I got to the age of 34, 35, I had an enormous amount of experience of working on the play and the part, and a real determination to try and present the whole of the text of Hamlet, in as far as we know it, in the most sort of spectacularly cinematic way one could. So I worked with Castle Rock and an amazing cast of actors with Derek Jacobi playing the king this time, not the prince, uh, and people like Charlton Heston and Julie Christie and Gerard Depardieu and Jack Lemmon and Robin Williams and Kate Winslet making an early appearance just before she went and did Titanic. And for me, it was about, it was about doing a film that concerned uh, the life of one family, a royal family, but whose uh, own story, when it unfolds with such tragic consequences, um, really changes the fate of nations. And so by the end of the story, uh, there's been a revolution. And yet at the, at the center of it is, you might say, a quite simple account of the necessity to grieve when we lose people. Because that grieving doesn't happen, a, a chain of events is set in motion that creates a great story full of fights, drama, love, passion, intrigue, an amazing uh, work of art from Shakespeare. And in this case, the chance to do it on 70 millimeter with Castle Rock was really one of the great, great privileges of my professional life.
You're thinking only as a warrior. This was an act of war. It was the act of but a few, doomed to fail. Look how far they got! We will find the breach in our defenses, and it will be sealed. As king of Asgard... But you're not king! Not yet. I got the job as the director of the first Thor film because uh, Kevin Feige knew that I was not particularly intimidated by the more heightened elements of the story that at one stage would have uh, men in tights riding horses over a rainbow bridge in space. If you could make that work, then maybe the story was going to work. And so I relished that opportunity of balancing the tone between something like that and then bringing the banished Thor, a Thor banished because of his uh, rebellious relationship to a stern father and a jealous brother, banished to Earth, and then uh, the movie allowing for a comic tone that plays around the idea of the fish out of water that is the hulking Thor in New Mexico and having to deal with the perplexed but brilliant Jane Foster, played by Natalie Portman. The chance to create the beginning of the world of Asgard and the world of the Nine Realms and everything that subsequent films might explore was a, a kind of Shakespearean tapestry that I relished and wasn't thrown by. I, I felt as though, no, you can be dramatic and you can be funny and you can be silly and you can be earnest and all of those things are the glory of something like uh, Thor and they're part of the glory of the mixture of things that you'll find in so many parts of the MCU. So to be to be asked to be at the beginning of what we did not know was then going to become, you know, one of the greatest cinematic phenomenon of the 21st century, that, that was a real, it was a, a career high. Whatever happens, what you've done with these two, it's phenomenal. The story of Belfast was one that was born out of the beginnings of the pandemic and the introspection that it brought that sent me in this time of uncertainty and an unknown future back to my time as a nine-year-old in Belfast where that same atmosphere was experienced when suddenly violence visited our otherwise very harmonious street and the whole world turned upside down much as it did for us all across the world in these last two or three years. And I wanted to write about how a nine-year-old with a nine-year-old's view of things, so inexperienced and beginning to understand how difficult it is to be a grown-up in a world that is so uh, volatile, I wanted to sort of chart that and in so doing look at the sacrifices my parents made to help us judge whether to stay or to leave in a difficult situation that was, was particular for every single family and to put a spotlight on some of the surprising things that went with that terribly violent time which was the amount of laughter and humor and love and song and dance and all the coping mechanisms that helped ordinary families put one foot in front of the other uh, at a time of sort of traumatic change. It was a, one of those sort of films that had to be written. And then uh, once my family approved of it, which thank God they did, it then felt as though it was important to try and make something that was sort of written directly from the heart uh, and, and, let it, and let it play to the hearts of people around the world. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England, now abed, shall think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap, whilst any speaks that thought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. <laughs> In directing my first film, Henry V, and thinking about what you would say to your younger self, I'd actually say well done, because one of the things that was part of that experience was a sort of fearlessness. It might have been born out of ignorance, but I guess what it resulted in was a real sense of following your own instinct. I had been in the play Henry V over two or three years and many, many performances, and so I had a fairly developed sense of how it might play as a story. And those instincts, I think, I, I, because I didn't have much else, to be honest, I had the observation that I'd had of working on some films and some television programs with very good people. But I also learnt there that one of the smartest things that you can ever say, if it's true, which in my case it often was while making Henry V, 
uh, the phrase is, I don't know. When someone asks you something, if you don't know, you really have to say it. I would have probably started saying that earlier if I started again. But what I admired about that was that it was relatively unfiltered. I didn't second guess myself. And I think I would give my advice to any first time director that that's, that's why you're there. I remember the cinematographer, Kenneth McMillan, uh, who I'd worked with on a Pat O'Connor film called A Month in the Country with Colin Firth. He was shooting Henry V. And um, he made the point to me, he said, don't, don't ever worry about some of these technical things. He said, you're learning very quickly and you ask questions all the time and you tell us what you don't know and that's all we need. But what we really want is your vision of this. We want your ideas. So don't think that there's some magic science that you have to find. Don't think that there's some magic other place to go for the secret of making a film. You're here because you have an idea of how to do it. Uh, the, you have the why, lots of other people will help you with the how. And I think intuitively, I kind of understood quite a bit of that. And I don't know whether I would say that to my young self. I'd say it to my old self. I'd say that to my old self now. So that I'd give the, the advice to my old self of, you know what, direct a bit more like you directed Henry V in the first movie you made. Well, he's only the greatest detective alive. I suspect you invited me for reasons other than the fun. Annette Benning, you know, said on uh, Death on the Nile that her best experiences with, with the best directors were that they were very organized. She said, when I say that, I know that it does not sound sexy, but believe me, when they're as organized as I found Chris Columbus, Paul Greengrass, Chris Nolan, Danny Boyle to be, the organization is all to do with clearing the playing field so that the maximum amount of creative spontaneity can occur. So they are all directors who have been there way before you. They are spiritually and sometimes actually up in the morning way before anybody else in order to try and answer every question, do every piece of prep, they practically can in order to try and prepare for the happening that they hope will occur. And um, the other thing I would say that I've noticed about those great directors, Chris Nolan is a real example of the ability to use time in a way that makes you feel as though you have all the time in the world. He does not respond to pressure, even though every day that he works on a film, as it is for any director, is pressurized. That, that applies to someone like Paul Greengrass as well, who brings also terrific compassion. He's a very compassionate and kind person. And so you just feel as though there is a, a genuine human interest there that it, that 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 makes you feel very assured and confident. And someone like Chris Columbus, when showing that quality to those young people in the in those Harry Potter films, I think was one of the reasons why they started so well that they were given a confidence that he had that was rare and that I've I've um, I've learned much from watching. We have a piano tuned, a chef stolen from Shepherds of Cairo, and enough champagne to fill the Nile. I very much. Uh, which you see in my film of Belfast, enjoy westerns. I've enjoyed them since I was a very young boy. And I think the, the mythic nature of them, some, something of the western is what I was trying to make with Belfast, but I think an actual western is something that I would be intrigued to try to do. I have a little idea that's been brewing. With me, everything is long-term development. I can have an idea from 20 years ago that's just been sizzling away for a while. And, you, and it, it, maybe it comes out at some point, maybe it doesn't. I've got a few scripts in bottom drawers uh, that might come back out and they all head towards that Western world.